with us today is uh, Dr. Emma Cohen. Uh, she's a fellow in human sciences at Wadham College and an associate professor within the Institute of Cognitive and Evolutionary Anthropology at the University of Oxford. She earned her PhD in anthropology at, Queen, at the Queen's University in Belfast and has held positions um, in numerous places, but um, of particular note and of interest uh, to our community. She's uh, held research positions at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig and the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics in the Netherlands. Dr. Cohen directs the Social Body Lab in the Institute of Cognitive and Evolutionary Anthropology at Oxford, investigating the links among social connections, group activity, and health in everyday behavior and culture. And today she is generously sharing with us her talk on the social brawn hypothesis, the effects of sociality on energy, fatigue, and performance in exercise. So please join me in enthusiastically welcoming Dr. Cohen uh, to give her talk. Thank you, Katie. Um, can you hear me okay? Just making sure everything's working. I should get my headphones in as well. Maybe relevant until later. Um, so I can't see anyone. <laughs> um, it's very strange, but I know we're all supposed to be getting used to this, but I, I haven't quite got used to it yet. Um, but hopefully you can hear me okay, and maybe I'll get a little buzz through the chat if there's any issue as we go along. Um, but it's great to be there here. I'm not sure where we are, but it's great to join you today for this seminar, and I'm really um, honored to be invited. Um, so yeah, I'm, this is the, the first airing of this name of the social brawn hypothesis. Obviously, it's a pun on the social brain hypothesis, and it's not taking a, a punt at the social brain hypothesis at all. But it's, um, it's really, um, a, it still feels like in some ways a sort of new area of research in the sense that it's kind of coming together slowly, but I think it is coming together. Um, and it's great to have an opportunity to talk um, to an evolution and medicine um, group about it. I think that's the first talk I've given to an evolution and medicine group. So that's great. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, so first up, um, it's not letting me advance. Let me see. Does that work? Okay, it is now, cool. Um, so first up, thanks to my um, wonderful collaborators um, who've done so much uh, of the work that I'll be talking about today along with me and, and thanks to our um, funders as well. So particularly Aaron Davis has had a lot to do with this work. Um, today. Um, so a few years ago, um, kind of in relation to research, but mainly reading for leisure, I picked up this book called The Boys in the Boat, and it, it tracks a, a wonderful story of an East Coast US team in the 1936 Olympics and, and how they made it all the way through um, the US qualifiers and, and won the Olympics that year. So that the <laughs> spoiler alert gone there, really, but fantastic story. Um, and in this book, which I was reading for leisure, but has kind of um, shaped a lot of my research since, there were a few um, quotes that really stood out to me. I was, I was interested in the, in the role of um, synchrony and human bonding, social bonding at the time. And so this quote I thought kind of described what happens when eight rowers get together so beautifully, just kind of the physical, but kind of visceral bonding that happens. The oars enter and leave the water at precisely the same instant. 16 arms must begin to slide forward and backward. They all bend and straighten at once and each action must be mirrored exactly by each oarsman from the end, one end of the boat to the other. And only will, then will it feel as if the boat is a part of each of them. And only then does pain entirely give way to exultation. And again, a bit later on, let me stop from advancing for some reason. Okay. Um, <clears throat> almost mystical bonds of trust and affection lift a crew above the ordinary sphere um, and replace um, kind of nine boys with one thing, a one unit, and that as they rode, effort um, was replaced by ecstasy. Um, and as I read, I thought, is this just kind of poetic license or is there more to it? And I've been focused, as I said, on how joint exertive activity contributes to social bonding via things like behavioral synchrony and social touch and other psychophysiological factors that are associated with exertion and social bonding. Um, but perhaps there was a causal arrow that kind of went in the opposite direction as well. Can this visceral bonding fundamentally alter the experience of effort, fatigue and pain? And is this maybe part of why performance in an interdependent team context is seldom just the sum of the parts, but more than that. Um, but more generally, how does sociality 
influence the physiology and subjective experience of pain and fatigue and feelings of effort in, in collective activity. And so that's what I'd like to talk about today and just a very brief um, outline of, of the, there are five kind of parts of the talk. First, very briefly, I'll describe what I kind of mean by exercise and then looking at performance and some of the, the, the work around exercise performance generally. Um, and then into what we take or what we've dubbed as the social brawn hypothesis. And then some of the studies that we've done um, looking into this, um, I, I've said five, that might be optimistic, maybe six, probably unlikely, <laughs> um, maybe four studies in brief, we'll see what there's time for. And then um, into some conclusions, maybe new questions and next steps for the research. Um, but I look forward to hearing your questions as well and suggestions. Um, so this is my April Fool. <laughs> Sorry to do this to you. This, this is Mr. Mr. Motivator. I don't know if he's made it across, across the pond at all. But when I say exercise, I want you to not think about this, not think exclusively about this. Um, so I take quite a broad definition, not just lycra clad leisure, but really any kind of goal directed, moderate to vigorous physical activity. So that could include dancing, uh, team sport, group hunting, physical labor, combat, uh, long distance travel for communication and so on. And I think some of the most fascinating inquiries um, into the limits of human endurance performance have not been in the context of sport and leisure necessarily, but actually survival. Um, and this is an image from uh, the Royal Geographical Society, a photographer who joined the um, Shackleton expedition to the South Pole and, uh, and uh, to try and cross Antarctica, the, the famous endurance expedition. Um, in 1914, so it was just before the outbreak of the First World War, and it soon saw the 27-man crew completely locked in by ice flues. Um, they didn't even make it to Antarctica, and those ice, the ice eventually crushed and submerged their ship, and so they lost their ship called Endurance, and the crew was left stranded to overwinter in Antarctica, and they were there for 20 months, um, and Shackleton's account of their ordeal is one of the most famous and, and incredible stories of human endurance, um, social bonding and survival. And in these pictures, you can see their heroic, but ultimately doomed efforts to cut their ship free of the ice and then trail their rescue boats, try and trail them to water, which was absolutely exhausting work under brutal conditions. They didn't get very far. Um, and incidentally, I think this, I love this picture. This, this is how they bonded. Um, this is um, well recognized for the, the morale boost that came with a good game of soccer. So when I say exercise performance, I'm referring to a very broad and elastic category. And, and kind of just as an aside, in his recent book, Exercised, um, Dan Lieberman dealt with um, running and dancing in the same chapter, which I think is great, and under the unifying criterion of jumping from one foot to the other. And I think that this reminds us sometimes to be mindful of the ways in which our socially constructed categories um, of human activity can ethnocentrically determine what bits of activity go together in our studies, in our departments, in, in funding research um, projects and so on. Um, but conventional exercise, exercise science sorry, is typically um, primarily focused on competitive performance um, as an end in itself, um, but evolutionary anthropology situates our unique capacities for endurance exercise in the context of what Herman Ponce has called the metabolic um, revolution that accompanied um, the emergence of um, hominin cooperative foraging, um, and that metabolic revolution also includes um, the um, rapid brain growth and, and sharing of surplus food. So we'll return to this later. Um, but you know, if one could imagine a hunter-gatherer exercise physiologist or psychologist, the natural home for questions about, I think, f fatigue and performance in exercise would be the long distances um, traveled in pursuit of prey or for communication, perhaps the all-night all dances and, and other extremely energetically costly rituals. So Herman Ponser also has an excellent new book about meta metabolism. And as he states, um, energy is life. Um, our body's roughly 37 trillion cells burn enough energy every 24 hours to bring 30 liters of ice water to a boil, which is a, a lot of activity, a lot of energy. Uh, fortunately, most of this activity goes on beneath the surface of, of conscious awareness and that's certainly outside of our control. But just a small portion is under our conscious control and that's the muscle activity that we use to move. Um, so movement and exercise is fundamentally about psychology and energetics and the ways in which the two combine. It really is one of the hottest topics, I think, in the science of exercise performance now. 
Um, because obviously, um, country schools aren't the only thing affecting muscle recruitment. Um, if they were, you and I could sprint a marathon. Um, Roger Bannister wouldn't have been the first person uh, to run a mile in, in, in under four, four minutes, um, just a few hundred meters down the road from where I'm sitting now. And at the time he stunned the world, people thought that the human body physically couldn't go that fast and that it would collapse in a state of what exercise physiologists call cellular catastrophe, complete sort of breakdown of homeostasis and, and regulation of the physiological systems um, and neural systems perhaps of the body. Um, but as is well known, it was really only a matter of days before his record um, was broken. Um, and uh, here he is crossing um, the tape at the end of his, his mile. Um, he looks pretty exhausted and ultimately energy expenditure in exercise performance is constrained by the rate at which energy can be metabolized and by the amount of available energy. Um, so optimal performance in physical activity requires decisions about how and when to invest energy. Um, so if I ask you, how fast can you run? Um, you might be quite right to ask me, well, what do you mean a mile? How far am I going, right? Um, and the strategy you adopt um, will depend on the distance. Um, and that strate strategizing is known as pacing. Um, and I think it's a gold mine for any cognitive scientist. So, you know, we tend to think of this as all very physical, but I think this is a gold mine for, also for any cognitive scientist interested in human cognition and behavior from a whole body, ecological sort of complex dynamical systems perspective. Um, it's complicated and even Bannister um, struggled with it as he describes in, in his memoir. So he wanted his um, pacemaker um, to go a bit faster, uh, but he didn't. And he felt so full of running, he says, but I would have had to pay for it later. Instead, he says, his pacemaker made success possible. So pacing in, in all exercise, not just endurance races, involves continuous decision-making. Um, and as Alex Hutchinson, is another fantastic book um, around these themes, Endure by Alex Hutchinson, he describes um, pacing in, in, in very kind of micro decision terms. So in a sense, every stride you take during a race is a micro decision. Will you speed up, slow down or maintain your current pace? Um, and it's now well recognized that there's a complex interplay of, of sensory, um, affective or emotional and, and cognitive processes that underpin um, these continuous micro decisions. And these include goals, um, uh, motivations or incentives, um, an understanding of the demands of the activity. So a knowledge, as I said earlier, a knowledge about how far or the duration and also the end point of the exercise and, and prior experience and knowledge. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's neither just about conscious control nor just about physiological limits. Um, again, Alex Hutchins said, if, if, if races were just about physiological limits, plumbing contest of whose pipes could deliver the most oxygen and pump the most blood, they would be very boring. Um, so in short, it's a combined mind-body thing. And that may seem pretty obvious in some ways, um, but it's quite surprising, I think, that um, until really the late 1990s and early 2000s, the dominant view in exercise physiology um, and psychology um, even was that the limits of exercise performance were determined by activity from the neck down. Um, but now there's wide acknowledgement of the central role as the, of the brain as regulator um, in exercise performance, um, such as in, in um, well, this really came, a lot of the work around this came out of um, Tim Noakes, um, central or integrative governor model of the brain, whereby continuous feedback from various systems is integrated to regulate exercise performance. Um, and this all helps to regulate homeostasis ultimately. Um, and it's complicated, as I said. So there's lots of kind of um, feed forward from the brain to the peripheral parts of physiology um, and lots of feedback from the peripheral physiology to the brain. And there are, there are lots of kind of well-recognized centrally, so centrally acting performance modifiers, um, including motivation, prior experience, and some of these things that I've already mentioned. Um, perhaps just as an aside, despite the name of kind of central governor model of the brain, I don't think it's entailed a wholesale swing to a neurocentric or neuroessentialist view of the brain with the brain kind of exaggerated as a controller, pulling all the levers of the body and the complete material basis of the mind. Um, I think in this, in this domain um, of, of cognitive science, if you like, the immediate importance of embodied homeostatic regulation 
in pacing and performance and exercise has kept the brain in its place. So um, to use um, the philosopher's, um, the philosopher Tom Fuchs's term, it's an organ of interrelations between the living organism and its natural environment. Um, and as the um, neuroscientist um, Antonio Damasio has called it, that it's actually the servant of whole organism homeostasis. The central, org central nervous system regulates um, whole organism homeostasis rather than kind of is this um, governor at the top of the hierarchy. Um, so performance regulation in, inter in exercise integrates a wide range of inputs from across the brain, body and environment, and ultimately these combine to produce sensations of effort and fatigue that, as many of us know, can be very hard to ignore. Um, but critically, even though that's the case, subjectively, this feeling, these feelings of effort, um, intense effort and fatigue happen well before there's really any threat of actual homeostatic collapse. Um, and this is described as, as a kind of reserve. Um, uh, another great book from the um, exercise physiologist, Frank Marino, um, talking about human fatigue and evolutionary perspective. He says, he, he presents quite a wide range of evidence from the physiological literature to say that cellular catastrophe can't be the exclusive explanation for the development of fatigue. Um, human physiology very seldom operates at maximal levels. There's always some reserve. So biological systems on the whole seem to kind of build in this kind of co conservative kind of, um, uh, these conservative mechanisms or structures or functions um, that retain some reserve. And, and why, he asked, why should such a reserve exist? Well, the obvious answer is that it can be mobilized in extraordinary moments. You may have just finished your big endeavor, but you may need to um, engage in another endeavor that's even more important for your survival. Or you may need to deploy energy to other ends, not necessarily physical activity, but for recovery, um, immune system function, and so on. Um, so in other words, the sense of effort or fatigue is an emotion or feeling that regulates performance within safe bounds. And there's always reserve in the tank. So we don't experience fatigue and exhaustion when our reserves are spent, even if that's how it feels. Um, rather the subjective experience of, of effort um, or how hard it feels at any given moment is flexibly calibrated and tuned according to a whole range of conditions and variables, including most critically for our, our research, the perception of available resources. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, so as, as exercise science resolves how best to integrate mind, brain and body and how all of this works, in understanding the limits of human performance, I think the discussion still remains resolutely individualistic um, with hardly any real consideration of relevant social factors and how they relate particularly to the perception of available resources and therefore performance. Um, so the individualistic focus, um, insofar as there's any social emphasis at all, has maintained it largely on so motivational factors that have to do with competition um, not cooperation and perceived support, which I think is a curious omission because sport is it's mostly social, um, you know, lots of team sport, but even when it's solitary, um, in many respects, it's social. There are often teams around, um, and this, or, or at least, you know, social um, connection even, um, whether it's in fans or otherwise, um, and the psychological importance of perceived sport through fans or, or, or teammates is well recognized. Um, and sociality um, in, in exercise sciences um, and sports sciences has been associated with greater motivation to engage in physical activity and exercise. And so therefore, that I think there's important applied potential to understanding better how sociality is involved in self-regulation of exercise performance. And I think there's plentiful evidence of resource sharing within teams, um, both in functional performance and in recovery. More generally, beyond exercise and across the health sciences, the impact of social connections and support is increasingly recognized in healthcare, um, disease prevention and recovery, um, and groundbreaking work by John Cassiopo and Julianne um, Holt Landstad and others um, revealed the extent to which isolation from social resources is itself a threat uh, to homeostasis and health. And returning to evolution, um, just as survival and, and reproduction became increasingly dependent on energetically richer foods via cooperative foraging, um, 
so too was it increasingly tied to close supportive relationships with others. Um, so again, we come back to um, uh, Herman Ponce's uh, metabolic revolution. By the way, it's some, I've pilfered quite a bit from his book, <laughs> taking pictures, and it's all it's all properly referenced here. But I still haven't finished the book, but it's absolutely fascinating book, and I'd highly recommend it. And he, you know, the, the, you can spot the difference in these two um, uh, uh, figures here: one of the apes and one of humans. And the, the difference is that the fatter, energetic um, line um, and fatter fat line, um, but also most critically, this this sharing. Um, so the, the capacity for activity, you can see the arrow going to, to activity, um, uh, uh, is kind of evolutionarily yoked with um, our capacity for sharing um, directly in the form of food, but also buffering risk through provision of care. Um, so in this view, cooperative sociality buffers the energetic costs and risks of endurance activity and may even have allowed this high cost, um, high risk behavior to evolve. Well, whether or not this part of the evolutionary story is accurate, it's clear that at some point, humans significantly intensified the sharing of energetic resources um, via close cooperative relationships. So close relationships, especially early in development, would come to signify resource availability. Um, and so moving on to the social brawn hypothesis and bringing all of this together, um, we propose that um, cooperative sociality um, relaxes the safety margin that conserves energy in the tank that can potentially be deployed for other activities. Cooperative sociality buffers the risks of spending energy. Um, so cues to social safety, um, which is what you know, cooperative social relationships can signal, um, whether they're implicitly or explicitly perceived, can modulate and calibrate the sensations or these alarms um, of fatigue and perceived effort and boost performance. So allowing people to dig a bit deeper into those hidden reserves that are kept, generally conservatively kept. Um, and so in the context of these cues, um, for a given level of energy expenditure, sense of effort is reduced um, and so for a given performance output, perceived fatigue and pain and effort are all reduced relative to conditions of social isolation um, or relative to conditions of a lack of perceived support or safety. And for a given level of fatigue and effort, um, performance is increased. So social bonds and connection and relationships that kind of signify the potential for sharing of resources or even care subsequent to the great, you know, the big effort so care to help you um, recover, um, they can all buffer um, this risk and enable you to kind of be a bit less cautious in conserving that reserve. So that's the kind of core of the social brawn hypothesis. And there's some evidence generally, so away from kind of social resources, um, that the perception of um, nutritional resources calibrates effort and performance, even the, in the absence of any actual resources. So there's a series of studies that has examined the performance eff effects of glucose-based sports drinks. So sports drinks, they boost performance, um, but the effects um, seem kind of suspiciously um, kind of quick to take hold, quicker than it would take, it seems, for their energy to make it to the bloodstream. Um, and in one study, when glucose was directly infused into the bloodstream, a method that should have had greater or you know, even faster performance benefits, the benefits of drinking, the benefits of taking the glucose drink disappeared. Um, and they returned actually when athletes were asked to swish the drink in their mouths and spit it out again after just five seconds. So performance was boosted despite no increase in, in perceived effort. So having the drink in the mouth briefly seemed to be more important for accessing the athlete's hidden reserves um, than getting it into the bloodstream, um, suggesting a centrally mediated effect. Um, okay. <clears throat> Can't go forward, let's see. Right, okay, so this is just the, the, the data from that study. Um, <clears throat> in a similar vein, so many studies now on the performance effects of beliefs about nutritional aids um, in the context of placebo studies, right? Um, so nocebo you see in the title, that's when um, belief about a particular, if you tell someone that um, 
something they're going to be given is actually going to make the performance worse, even though it's the same as the thing that is going to make it better. <laughs> it has this nocebo effect and a placebo effect is a, is a positive effect on performance. Um, and so a recent um, review of 32 placebo and nocebo studies with quite a big um, number of participants as far as kind of exercise science goes, has shown a small to moderate effect of nutritional placebos such as caffeine uh, on performance. And just to give one of the, you know, the earlier examples, I think it's a great example, studied by my, my colleague, um, Chris Beedy um, and his colleagues, um, participants performed a cycling trial. So this was a maximum effort 10K time trial. And, and they observed when the participants gave, stopped due to fatigue. Um, so they were looking to see whether the placebo that they would give them would actually make them go longer. Um, and overall produced you know, more output. Um, and there were three conditions. Um, so there was a placebo condition where the participants were told they were being given a placebo. Um, and this was all within subjects as well. Um, and then there was a condition in which they were given what they were told was a moderate dose. And then a condition where they were given what was uh, they were told was a high dose. Um, and of course, they're given lots of information about how the caffeine it boosts performance. And there are questions around that. They asked the participants, um, yeah, you know, questions that kind of probe whether they believe what they're being told. Um, <clears throat> however, in all conditions, an identical placebo capsule was administered. Um, so when participants thought they'd received the moderate dose, um, the performance increased, um, this, this, this was mean power actually that they measured, um, increased by 1.3%, um, which is an increase, but not necessarily um, going to make much of a difference, even in the fine margins of this sport. So they didn't make too much of a deal of that, but the high dose actually increased it by 3.1%, which is quite a meaningful difference. But if they thought they'd received the placebo, the performance declined relative to baseline um, by 1.4%. Um, and I think that the, the qualitative statements um, are very interesting. So participants said, it, it seems that the participants weren't just kind of more motivated. Um, it seems that it really was acting on their perceptions of effort. Um, so I was able to push harder with less pain um, I was surprised actually how different it felt. Certainly that first tablet I took, I thought, well, this is a downside easier than it was the last time. And it was easier to put the effort in. There wasn't any tiredness creeping in. Um, so I think these results and qualitative statements are consistent with the hypothesis that expectations about available ergogenic resources can relax the safety margin and allow access to hidden reserves. Um, so summing up so far, um, perceptions, um, uh, that there are available resources um, can lead to implicit or expect, uh, explicit belief or expectation of resources, um, a kind of, there's more safety um, overall. Um, and this um, increases activation in relevant central nervous system mechanisms that may have to do with reward. It could be about anticipation of reward through dopamine systems, um, other reward systems, endorphins and endocannabinoids. So a lot of there's, there's been lots of research on the kind of neuroscientific um, and neurophysiological underpinnings of these effects, um, which of course are demonstrating that it's not all just in the mind, whatever that means. Um, and these interact with afferent um, uh, sensory feedback from, from the rest of the body. Um, and this influences, so this expectation of resources um, influences perception of effort. So how hard it feels is reduced. This is about the kind of adaptive calibration or um, regulation um, of outputs in relation to the available resources um, and potentially leading um, to accessing those hidden reserves and greater energetic expenditure and better um, performance, so higher performance outcomes, both in terms of behavioral, um, such as time to exhaustion, um, but also physiological, so you could measure lactate um, or VO2 max or oxygen uptake. Um, that's all else being equal. So holding motivation equal, although that might uh, interact with some of these things, but holding motivation equal, holding a lot of these other things that have been shown to be performance modifiers equal. So my question is, do, do social cues have similar effects? Um, <clears throat> and there's evidence generally that systems of um, psychophysiological regulation don't stop at the physical boundaries of the individual, um, but they're profoundly influenced by social relationships. Um, and I think that the study of pain offers some particularly relevant evidence for the social brawn hypothesis. Um, so I, uh, Naomi Eisenberger and colleagues showed that viewing a picture of a close attachment figure 
versus a stranger or an object while being given a carefully controlled dose of pain. So in, in that case, a, a heat stimulus, you could control how much of the stimulus was being experienced. This reduced ratings of pain unpleasantness um, and increased activity in neural regions involved in reward processing, but in safety signaling in particular. So all of these studies, um, I've kind of provided some inf inspiration for our research and, and our methods um, uh, in order to try and establish tests of this social brawn hypothesis, this idea that the kind of availability of social support or perceptions of kind of close bonded social relationships um, and therefore the potential availability of resources um, for physical activity actually calibrate these systems that ultimately produce feelings of effort and fatigue that cause people to slow down and eventually stop. Um, <clears throat> so our first question, um, the first study we really did in this area was does rowing in a group um, versus rowing solo raise pain thresholds? Now, it wasn't on a river <laughs> like this, um, but it, they probably had the same sorts of grimaces. Um, so this is the Oxford University Rowing Club and we actually just piggybacked this study um, on their normal training, which is highly kind of controlled and, and regimented. Um, so they would do 50 minutes of rowing ergometers but for the study we had them do it alone or in a group of six um, so this was just in normal training and so they were quite um, well trained in holding their performance constant so they actually produced that was part of the control they, they produced the same output across conditions and what we measured before and after um, was their pain or we called it discomfort to make it not too much so so we measured pain threshold in private using a blood pressure cuff um, which we'd um, pledge to their non-dominant arm and pump up um, uh, gradually and take a measure to the nearest five, um, uh, what is it, milligrams of something, <laughs> pressure at least, um, before um, and after the session. So we um, take that measure of discomfort um, <clears throat> in the absence of, I don't know, more direct measures of, of pain and more expensive ones. Um, and here are just the, the kind of descriptive results. So um, we had, there were two sessions of individual and groups. So there was a little bit of repeated measures, but this kind of just shows the means for, for both sessions. Um, and in the individual training, um, there was a significant pre to post increase in pain threshold, um, but almost there was almost a three, which we kind of expected, and that was significant, but almost a threefold increase again in the pain threshold change in the group training condition. Um, so this has been replicated since by other labs um, with runners as well um, and with rowers um, using a synchrony and a non-synchrony manipulation. And they only found this in the synchronous manipulation. So our group condition was synchronous just by default. Um, and so together, I think this suggests something perhaps about group synchrony in particular um, that is responsible for these raised pain thresholds. Um, as I said, the performance was held constant. So it wasn't just that maybe over a higher power output, and we measured that as well, um, that, that, you know, there were maybe more and there was more of a rower's high by the end of it. That was all held constant. Um, so that meant also then that there was still the question of whether athletes can go faster, harder, longer, if they're in a cohesive group environment. Um, so do cues to social bonding allow people to access those hidden reserves and enhance performance for the same perceived effort? So we conducted the next study um, with the Oxford University Rugby Football Club um, and measured performance as an outcome variable. Um, and synchrony was again manipulated as an independent variable, but this time as more of a prime. So a little bit, if you think about the rugby hacker. So we manipulated the conditions of a six minute warm up um, before an individual sprint test. Um, so participants uh, warmed up solo um, and the, the warm up was full body exercises, repetitive exercises, and they would do it um, to quite a strict time, a beat um, that we played through a metronome and headphones. So they did that when it was solo and they did it um, non-synchronously with teammates. So we played the beat differently through the headphones. Um, and also every time there's a message, I can't go forward. Yep, synchronously um, with teammates. Okay, so there were three three conditions. Again, it was all within, within subject. So each person took part in all of the three conditions in counterbalanced order. Um, and after they'd done their six minute warm up, the participants were led to opposite ends of the field um, where they couldn't see each other and they completed a highly challenging sprint test. So there were five sets of continuous all out running separated by brief fixed recovery times. 
and the performance output, which was our main dependent variable, was the aggregate um, of all of their sprint time. Um, so it's a really challenging test. Um, it's used by the England rugby team. And we also measured the ratings of perceived exertion um, using a standard scale and then a subjective experiences in exercise scale, which measures things like fatigue and positive well-being and, and distress. Um, and here you can see the, the results. Um, so this is the, the time uh, overall, the performance, um, how long it took them to do the sprint. Um, and we found that compared to the non-synchronous warm-up condition, in the synchronous condition, there was, um, so this is overall just over four minutes of, of running. Um, and there was a reduction of, of over six and a half seconds in the synchronous warm-up versus, versus the non-synchronous warm-up. So again, they did, they did the synchronous, the warm-up together, but they did the sprint separately. Um, so this is, a, I think, a competitively, it's significant, but it's also, I think, a competitively meaningful increase in ability in these highly physically fit athletes. Interestingly, there's no significant effect um, uh, comparing synchrony and solo, um, but we still get this a trend in the hypothesis direction. Solo looks much more like non-synchronous than synchronous, um, and there's still a reduction there of, of 4.2 seconds. Um, perhaps most importantly, um, even for their enhanced output, um, there were no differences in, in perceived exertion or fatigue, well-being or distress. So performance output was higher for the same perceived, um, for, for the same amount of perceived effort um, and fatigue. And I think these results are in line with the hypothesis that cues to social bonding, like synchrony, as has been demonstrated in other research, including work that we've done, um, calibrate the brakes or, or alarms that keep exercise within in normal safety margins. <clears throat> so we're, we're rattling through, I'm on study three. Um, so the third study then, we actually wanted to go beyond sort of a prime of support and actually manipulate the presence of social support during the exercise. Uh, but we wanted to do that while controlling for audience effects. Um, so, not, so having social support available, but not necessarily kind of bearing down on you because that could introduce kind of reputational or perhaps you know, um, these other kinds of audience effects. So um, at recruitment, participants were asked um, to bring a companion with them. And that is, um, as we said, someone you feel you have a close connection with and that you can depend on in times of need, such as a friend or romantic partner or a family member. So that's that attachment figure. Um, and the manipulation, there were two between participants conditions this time. Um, and manipulation um, uh, was that um, they were going to, be, the, the exercise or the, the the key participant was going to be doing an exercise task and they were aware of that. Um, when they both came in, a lot of the exerciser and the companion, they filled in some demographic and other questionnaires about their relationship and so on, background questionnaires. Um, and then there was the, this um, test. Um, and as they were taken into this cycling task, which is four 30 second maximum effort cycling bouts um, with three second breaks, as they were taken in to do this, um, they were told in the companion condition that the companion would be waiting in the next room should they need anything at all. That's all that we said. Um, and then in the solo condition, they were told that their companion that they brought with them had finished their task, um, had done their questionnaires and they had gone home, which was actually the case. We'd sent them home. Um, and then the participants were led through this task. There were warm ups and so on. Um, <clears throat> and our main dependent variables was um, the power output which was a measure we could get from, from this ERG, um, and also their ratings of perceived exertion. And they were asked, you know, they were told that this is a strenuous exercise and, um, you know, they, would, they were asked to give, it was absolutely crucial that they give their, their maximum effort. And there was a reminder of this before every bout. And af after every bout, we took these um, effort or exertion measures, sorry. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I'll go into this in a little bit later. We were interested in neuroticism as a moderator of the effect of social support on performance. Um, and also just as controls, we took um, lots of measures because this is with the between, participant, uh, between participants design. We wanted to make sure that our, um, there were no confines across these conditions of you know, differences of the companion relationship and differences in fitness. So this was all, this was all straightforward. Um, because exertion is quite important in the results of this design, I've, I've put up the kind of standard Borg rating of perceived exertion scale here for you to see. This is what it looks like. And our participants on the whole were around 17, 18. 
Um, so you'll see that in a moment. <clears throat> so very hard, somewhere up toward extremely hard. Uh, 77 participants. Um, <clears throat> and I'll just show you the, um, the, the first two bouts. So in the first two bouts, um, we see that um, the orange line is the companion condition and that the, the, the y-axis the y is showing us on the left, on the left-hand chart is showing us the, um, their power output. So that's the perform our performance measure. Um, orange line is the companion, the people who had a companion who stayed um, and the black line is the solo condition. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the ratings of perceived exertion figure. Um, so for these first two bouts, it looks like the companions went out, those who had a companion um, in the next room, went out a bit faster. Um, and they, they also had, you know, higher ratings of perceived exertion than those in the solo condition. Um, but then their, their power output came down pretty equivalent um, with those in the solo condition. Um, but interestingly, those in the solo condition for the last two bouts, um, they had a much higher, um, not a much higher, but this was a significant interaction where they had a higher rating of perceived exertion for that similar output. So basically overall, those in the companion condition, they start out quicker um, for some reason, don't know why, um, and at higher perceived effort, but they can't maintain the pace and they fall to the same level as those in the solo condition. Um, but despite potentially having expended more energy in those earlier bouts and therefore being potentially more fatigued, they maintain the same output as those in the solo condition in the final two bouts um, and also for a lower level of perceived exertion. Um, so there's fatigue that then those in the solo condition keep pace with those in the companion condition, but at higher levels of perceived exertion. So it's not quite the clean performance ex uh, effects we expected. Um, in comparing the companion and the solo conditions. And that might be owing to pacing and general training inexperience in this sample. They weren't athletes you know, who train um, daily. Um, it might also be that the salience of the support dropped off across the session. So if you think about something like fan support, you know, it's not enough to say, it's a bit like in relationship, it's not enough to just say, I love you once a year, right? <laughs> so even with fan support, it's not enough, you know, just to cheer at the start of the game and that's enough. Um, you know, maybe ongoing salience of the support um, might have been um, an issue. Um, um, or perhaps also this was a convenient sample of support. Um, so these were mostly students. We asked them to bring their attachment figure, you know, with them to the lab. It's possible that their attachment, their, their closest attachment figures, you know, don't live in Oxford. Um, so it might just have been a kind of availability sample. So maybe those are some of the reasons for the less than, than clean, clean results here. Um, I did mention that we looked at neuroticism as a moderator um, in this. These are, at this point, these are quite small sample because we, we, we did a kind of tripart split um, with our data. Um, so we've got those who are, we split up those who are low in neuroticism and those who are high in neuroticism. Um, and so in panel A, you can see the exercises who were low in neuroticism. And clearly there you can see in terms of the output that those in companion condition perform significantly better um, than those in the solo condition. And actually, when you look at panel B, those in high neuroticism, it flips, right? So those they, people who are high in neuroticism actually perform better when their companion isn't in the next room. Um, and the reason we were interested in just exploring this is because, um, well, this is in line with, with evidence for individual differences in how people's kind of conditioned responses to support availability um, and there's a broader literature suggesting that there are, you know, we don't all kind of perceive support cues in the same way. Um, uh, receiving support can lead to feelings of indebtedness and so on. And there's some, there's some suggestion that might be linked to, to neuroticism. So this idea of kind of indebtedness or inconveniencing a support figure. Uh, importantly, again, there was no difference here in, in ratings of perceived exertion. Um, this is something I think we'll want to take forward, looking at these individual differences um, generally. <clears throat> so the next study, um, sort of going back to the kind of the messiness of the main analyses, the next study sought to better control for factors of experience and support salience and, you know, the, the, who the support figure actually was. Um, this is quite a fancy, this is an FMRI, FMRI compatible um, 3D printed hand grip. Um, so this is kind of where this study might be going, um, if we can get some sort of suitable collaborators, I'm not sure. Um, 
but it could go into to a scanner and see what's actually going on, you know, under the hood. Um, so it's a very controlled experiment um, in this case. Um, and we were comparing effects also of social support and, and a performance enhancing drug. So we had a placebo condition and this was um, supposedly beta alanine. Most of our participants hadn't heard of it, but it is a performance enhancer, but of course it was a placebo, which they didn't know. Um, <clears throat> and it was this uh, a grip force task um, and participants um, uh, took part in eight second trials, a whole lot of them. Um, and it was a within subjects design. So there were these two blocks in counterbalanced order, placebo and control. And we had a whole kind of song and dance. It was the, the about placebo. So the whole charade, it was um, done in a hospital. There were white coats, there was a pharmacy. We brought the tablet in a white baggie. We kind of weighed the, or black baggie. We weighed the um, participant so that we could, you know, supposedly get the right dose and everything. Um, and um, the participants on average said that the placebo um, boosted their performance. Actually, it didn't. We didn't get an effect of, of placebo, <clears throat> um, as you'll see. Um, so there were 72 participants. They were screened for um, strenuous exercise or drugs and alcohol intake in the past 12 hours, injury and, and all of that. Um, <clears throat> so within each block, there were 14 subblocks of three trials. Um, and within subblocks, participants either viewed um, a photo of a support figure that they pre-submitted or a stranger um, on a computer screen in front of them. Horrible figure. <laughs> but this kind of shows the structure of the design. The first exercise block, either um, placebo or control. Second exercise block, either placebo or control, whichever one you hadn't had. And then you get these subblocks, each with three um, trials. Um, and the three trials are colored. Um, and those were different levels of difficulty. Um, relative to their baseline maximum hand grip strength. So 40, 50, and 60% of their, of their um, maximum hand grip strength. Um, <clears throat> and so they see this visual interface in front of them on the screen. When they weren't squeezing the hand grip, it, um, you'd see the red line at the bottom of the screen. And when they'd squeeze it, the aim was to keep that line over the white line on the screen. And when it was over the white line, it would, or on it or over it, it would turn green. So that was their aim for the duration of the eight second trial. And our main dependent variables um, were their grip, grip force output, which we could measure um, through this um, uh, little 3D printed um, grip and um, the perceived difficulty. So how hard was it to keep the, the bar above the line and then perceived effort or motivation? How much effort did you put in to keep the bar above the line? Okay, <clears throat> I realize I'm a bit short on time. Um, <clears throat> So we find an overall effect um, of the support figure photo, but that's kind of um, um, overridden by what by an interaction between the support um, and trial difficulty um, uh, variables. Um, so in actual fact, you can see here the trial target difficulty. Um, the bottom line, the green one is 40%, the yellow one is 50% and the, the red one is 60%. So we find actually the greatest effects when the trial was most difficult, objectively difficult. Um, and we actually don't find any effect at all at 40% of maximum hand grip. Um, so the social support effects on performance were stronger in objectively more difficult trials. And I think this suggests a buffering effect whereby effective support and performance is contingent on the level of difficulty. There was no significant effect of placebo. There was a trend in, in the hypothesis direction. And we, but we also find a kind of order effect. So if you'd received the placebo first and then were led to believe that it had worn off um, by the second block, then these participants reported higher levels of difficulty um, than participants who'd received the placebo second. Um, but their outputs didn't vary across conditions. You can see there's more variation on the top line there. And again, this I think this is something that we want to explore. Not everybody perhaps responds to social support cues in the same way. Um, <clears throat> okay, so performance output is higher in support condition for the same amount of perceived difficulty. I think I'm probably all out of time. There's a couple of, the, what, one study quickly, I don't know if you're familiar with Park Run over there, if you've got one in, in your city. Um, we have lots over here in the UK and they're all around the world. This is a free weekly timed run. 
Um, and this is a, a study that we ran in the context of Parkrun. It's very much a community run. It's, it's You run for fun primarily. It's not a competition. You haven't got people kind of working at the limits of performance. And this was kind of extending our research a little bit to examine not just the buffering effects of sociality at the limits of exercise performance, but the potential boosting effects of just the intrinsic pleasure of social connection. Um, so is there an energizing quality to the intrinsic pleasure of social connection in the context of physical activity? This is me, <laughs> my first and last park run, um, which is over a year ago because then this happened and we all had to stay apart. Um, uh, but we got a research done um, before that happened. And that's my daughter as well, by the way, it's my random, random child. Um, so that we, we worked with 144 participants um, and the majority indicated through our survey that they were primarily there to run with other people rather than to improve their ranking or their personal time. So it wasn't so much about them trying to push their limits. And we asked them whether or not they came or met up with friends or family, um, their feelings of support by the park run community um, and feelings of being a part of the park run community uh, and their pre-run sociality. So whether they had they got ready or hung out with others versus got ready or hung out on their own. So there were three kind of social independent variables in our survey. It was repeated measures. People could take part as much as they want over a series of weeks. Um, <clears throat> and their main dependent variables were the ratings of feelings of fatigue, energy, enjoyment, exertion. And then we had objective um, runtime measures um, that we retrieved um, from a database. And the main sort of headline from this is that we didn't um, find a direct effect of sociality on run times, but there was a significant effect through perceived energy for all three of our social predictors. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, a, a kind of mediation effect between social prediction, uh, social predictor variables of coming with others, feeling supported, um, getting ready with others and the performance. Um, and all of the three um, social predictors were also positively associated with how much participants enjoyed their runs. And there was no effect of sociality in this context on perceived fatigue. Um, and it perceived, fatigue, perceived um, effort and fatigue were highly correlated, but fatigue and energy were only weakly correlated. Um, and these are actually distinct constructs in the literature. Um, so feelings of fatigue relate specifically to the perceived difficulty of maintaining task goals, while feelings of energy relate um, to the perceived ability to maintain task goals. And they're typically captured as vigor or vitality. Um, so overall, perhaps this suggests that across exercise of different intensities, there are different effects of sociality um, with boosting effects on felt energy and performance at lowering intensities, um, but buffering effects on perceived effort and fatigue at higher intensities. I don't have time, I'm not gonna talk about this. <laughs> this is where we actually link um, bonding. This is a, a, it's a big kind of overnight tough hike that teenagers do here in a big event that's run by the military every year. And we do find effects um, on mental well-being of all of some of these things that we've talking about, been talking about um, bonding and performance and, and team support. And team support also makes it feel a bit less threatening. <clears throat> okay, I've got, I think, two more slides, so I'll, I'll wrap it up very quickly. Um, conclusion, we find social er ergogenic effects on performance and perceptions of pain, fatigue and energy across a range of contexts. Um, these are just summing up um, the studies that I've talked about. So increased performance for perce same perceived effort in the rugby sprint um, task. Same performance for lower perceived effort, at least in the in the latter stages of the cycling test, and, um, and maybe even greater performance for the same perceived effort among those who are low in neuroticism. Um, so support effects are stronger under objectively more difficult conditions, um, potentially more robust than placebo. Um, and in fun conditions, um, social factors predict greater enjoyment, um, and they also indirectly predict better performance via felt energy. And these social effects were engendered through lots of different kind of um, in, uh, manipulations. So synchrony, perceptions of support availability, a cue of an attachment figure, um, perhaps social connection and integration. Um, and we didn't talk about that last one. Um, and this is all consistent, I think, with the social safety or buffering and perhaps a social kind of reward or boosting effects. Um, on performance, so social bonds can facilitate access to hidden reserves. 
Um, I feel I should probably wrap up. These are these are bigger, deeper questions, I think, that remain. Is there a role for um, sociality and reward in the evolution of human endurance capacities? Um, maybe there is ex ex interesting extensions to, you know, beyond exercise and to other domains of endurance activity. And I absolutely love this um, figure from, from Ponce where he puts pregnancy right up there with Tour de France and so on um, in terms of um, energy expenditure over duration. And maybe there are extensions to other domains in which perceived effort is the, um, or exertion is the critical determinant of performance, perhaps even in, in more cognitive domains and less physical, although the two, it would seem overlap. Um, and this is where we're going next with some of this. So in terms of the individual differences, what are those kind of developmental or ontogenetic factors that influence how um, we perceive the availability of social re reward or resource? So thank you very much for listening. And I'm sorry to have taken you all up the way up. It's nine o'clock my time. So <laughs> at least we haven't got that far in your time. I'll stop sharing. <clears throat> that okay. All right. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Cohen. And um, we'll take a moment for one question from the audience um, before we take a quick break for uh, reconvening with just the students. So if any of our um, audience members um, who are not in the discussion class uh, have a question for Dr. Cohen, um, now is the time to ask. Okay, I'm going to ask the question then, um, which is uh, when you you touched on this that you're quite interested in ontogeny. Um, what uh, would you explain when in in development or life course you're particularly interested in investigating for your next stages of your research? Oh, that's a good question. I think so. We're going to be hopefully starting a new project um, in the fall um, that will be working. Um, with a much more diverse sample than we've had access to up till now. Um, and the idea is that we work with um, uh, kind of grassroots sports clubs. And I think that's going to take us to, you know, sort of <clears throat> age eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, you know, that sort of thing. But it's more in terms of that availability rather than a kind of theoretically selected age range. I did read an interesting study on pacing and how it relates to the Piagetian stages of development. <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, so it's kind of linking it to kind of um, cognitive development, I think in an interesting way, I'm not sure I would track it against the Piagetian stages of development, but it maybe suggests that, you know, you, we ought not to go too early um, in, in our um, kind of examination. Um, but that's more on the exercise si side. I think the kind of how, how we respond to and, and condition ourselves to other people as kind of relationship resources, you know, of energy and energy exchange. I mean, that starts at birth. So hopefully we'll find kind of the effects of that um, in terms of trying to understand some of these individual differences. We may be barking up the wrong tree entirely, but I think you know some of these individual differences must relate to ontogenetic experiences of social relationships and whether they are kind of, you know, whether they are buffering relationships in the sense that I've talked about. Um, so yeah, not too young, not too old. 